Welcome to the Smart Property Investment Show with your host, Phil Tarrant. Hi okay, everyone, how are you going? Uh, welcome to the podcast. Uh, I'm going to get straight into it today because normally I'd have some sort of long-winded introduction to try and paint a picture so I can introduce my guest, but who I have in the studio is one of our, our regular guests. You would have heard him on the Smart Property Investment Show prior and probably seen him quite a lot on smartpropertyinvestment.com.au. Simon Presley, Head of Research, Propertyology. Simon, how are you going, mate? You well? Really well, Phil. I love these chats. Mate, they're really good. I, I look forward to them. And it feels like there's nearly monthly now, I would imagine. Like, um, I can't yeah, remember last yeah. time. Yeah, we, we should at least be doing it monthly because when we get on the airwaves, uh, you're often the most popular podcast that we do. So I think last time I gave you a hard time around this, but uh, which was a, <laughs> a, a derogatory Australian way of saying this guy actually knows what he's talking about. So hence the reason why you're back. And uh, we had some fun last time and I quite enjoyed the tempo mm-hmm. of the chat that we had. So I want to try and keep consistent with that. So for those of you that don't know Simon or his business, Propertyology, he runs a a buyer's advocacy, a buyer's agency, property strategy business, but it's very much driven through the science of data, interpretation of data, rather than, you know, the the feel or emotion of property. And then uh, he sort of applies the narrative to it and and deepens it out. So uh, he's got a lot of happy clients around Australia. I know he's um he's not stuck to metro areas. You you're a big fan of um of the regional areas based on this property science, and you could call it a science, isn't what you do? It is, but like a lot of other sciences, you know, medicine and that sort of stuff, forecasting the weather, it's by no means an exact science, but mm. but there are a number of things that history has taught us to have an influence, which is good. So today. What I'd like to do, Simon, is I've got some facts here that me and you have worked on over the last couple of weeks just to to help steer us in this conversation. I'm going to call them fun facts. And for a lot of people who have maybe got properties in these areas or a part of these stories, they might not be so fun because some of these facts might be quite alarming to a lot of people. And what we're going to do, we'll just go through them. We've got 20 of them and we'll just have a quick chat around them. And I think you'll enjoy this discussion because it's just going to get you thinking around the, the interconnectivity of a marriage between the science of property and property investment and the realities of property and property investment or the narratives of that as well. So let's kick off, Simon. Fact number one, I'm going to give you a number. You tell me about it. $35,568. Yeah. So I thought good place to start this discussion. This is the motivation for property investors. Mm. That figure there, let's round it off, $35,500 is the amount that a household couple, not one person, would receive as an aged pension. Not a lot of money. So those of us who don't invest, the household's got thirty-five grand and whatever superannuation you've got to live the rest of your life off when you stop working. That's what we need to invest. So thirty-five grand is the age pension. That's, that's full age pension, that's, right? That's it. Yeah, and and to get a full age pension is quite a little bit challenging these days because they look at your total assets, sometimes including your house, depending on your situation. You can live on that. That's not a lot. That's like. Not that's not a person. That's not a person. That's that's a couple. Yep. So if you're listening to this now and you're not already motivated to invest, just keep repeating to yourself thirty five and a half thousand dollars for myself and my partner thirty five thousand dollars. And a if year. you think superannuation is going to be a lot of money, even if you got a million bucks in super, just divide that by however many years you expect to live off it, and it won't last very long. Or oh, for a lot of people, you're retiring it. 65, you know, most of us should be living 85, right? You know, 90. So you get another 25 years on this this great planet that we live on, it's not going to go far. Yeah. I sum life up from, I guess, from an investor's point of view, the first 20 years learning, primary school, high school, some of us go to university, the next 45 years earning, so then we're now at age 65, and the last 20 years doing whatever you're able to do from the first 65. So that 45-year window is a lot of time, but uh, and time is free, but it's what you do with it that counts. And time is something that you can't get back. So this point number one, then fun fact number one, I'd say make hay while the sun is sort of shining, right? Yeah. Okay, all right. Fun fact number two, 7.4%. I imagine you're going to talk to me around this number around yield. No. Mm, good guess, but no. Okay, there no. we go. So 7.4% is the average annual rate of capital growth over the last 20 years for Australia's oldest regional city. And for those who don't know which city that is, it's the city of Launceston in Tasmania. So 7.4% per annum. We'd love that in one year, wouldn't we? But that's been the average over 20 years. Is that compounding? 
average um, average, yeah, average yeah, okay. 20, yeah, yeah, compounding yes so, compounding. so every year 7.4 percent on the year prior compounding boom, boom, yeah, yep. yeah. Okay. so obviously there's been plenty of years in there where it's been more than 7.4 percent yep. and you know plenty of years where it might have been zero but the average annual over 20 long years is 7.4 percent for our oldest regional city our oldest capital city i'm sure everyone knows which location that is is sydney 7.1 percent still a high rate of growth and then if we look at the yield for each of those locations, our oldest regional city, 5.4%, and our oldest capital city, 3.1% over the last 20 years. So what you're saying is a tale of two cities, right? But the there's purpose a lot of, of that, commonality between them. Well, the purpose of that stat is that those who ever believe one is better than the other, you're wrong. Over time, they all grow, and they all grow by a lot, whether it's capital city or whether it's a region, but they all grow in different years by different amounts. So this goes back to the first point around 35000 bucks, and you've got 45 years to earn your money. If you're making hay, if, you, if you've got 45 years in a market, if you invest correctly, irrespective yep. of whether it's regional or capital city, you probably do okay. you just got to get going at it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yep. So you could have bought 20 years ago. Of course, no one can predict the future, but 20 years ago, if we had whatever the cost of a Sydney house was back then, it would have been about 300K, mm. right? So you could have bought one house in Sydney for 300K or you could have bought three houses in Launceston for a combined 300K. Over the next 20 years, they both would have grown by a lot. The three properties in Launceston would have grown by a smidge more than the one Sydney property, but still would have grown by a lot. But the cost to hold, there'd be cash flow positive if it was the three Launceston houses properties. because because the yield is also important as well as the capital growth. Okay. Great. So fun fact number three, 0.6%. So that is the current, here we are in October 2019, that is the current vacancy rate in Mildura. For those who don't know Mildura, Mildura is Australia's 40th largest city in regional Victoria, uh, one of the world's most productive agricultural precincts. I was going to say oranges, right, from Mildura, is that where they come from? Uh, all sorts or, of commodities also, out okay. there, yeah. Um, yeah. Stone fruits and nuts and grains. Yeah, so it's um, uh, median house prices tripled over the last 20 years out in Mildura. It's still very affordable, though. You can buy a, a standard house for under 300000 there today. Got a rental yield of 6.1%, a lot of pressure on rents. And the last 12 months, Mildura's grown by 8.5%. That's capital growth in a year that most locations in Australia have done nothing and some have gone backwards. So, sorry, uh, you mentioned quickly, help me with my geography again, yeah, where Mildura, Mildura is. Yeah. So in West Victoria, very yeah. close to the border of Victoria and South Australia. Okay, I, know, yeah. I got it. All right, I know where it is. That's cool. Really, that, that's performing pretty well, 40th biggest city in Australia. Yep. I might have a look at that. Anyway. There's some stats within some within oh, I can see where you're heading point. with this. You're showing that, that it's pretty good to invest regionally to my uh, original- The strategic selection of today's fun facts is to sh- is to help the audience see all of Australia, not a smidgen of Australia. And I think that's a really important point to help shape your mindset. Don't be those investors that only look at metropolitan areas. Yes, they're good, but there's other opportunities out there. I'm going to get to point number four, but before we do, we're just going to go to a quick break. Back in a moment. Welcome back, everyone. Here with Simon Presley, Head of Research, Propertyology. We're having some fun facts. I'm going to go straight into it because I think we're probably going to run out of time today. Point number four, 22nd. 22nd is Brisbane's position on the property ladder of Australia's most expensive cities. So from a population size, Brisbane is Australia's third biggest city, obviously after Sydney and Melbourne. But from a median house price, it's ranked number 22. Number one is Byron which is our 73rd largest town or city, by no means our biggest city. So this is the most, ex- the most expensive aver- city. Yep. Most expensive average from price. Medi- from, from a median, median, median house. Okay, yep. Yep. So Byron's first, but it's our 73rd largest from a population size. A surf Coast is ranked at number four, so it's actually above Melbourne. Coffs Harbour is ranked at 23, which is above Perth. And Broome at number 39 for most expensive it costs the same as the median house price in Hobart. So there's a good cross-section of the cost of housing across the country. All right, I'm really enjoying this because uh, it's funny how you could interpret just the assumptions you make as a property investor and what the reality is. Yeah. So it's sort of... It's not about size, it's is it? It's not about size, you know. Um, all right, uh, point number five, 41%. 41% is the... Portion of, so in Australia, there are 3.67 million investment properties. Roughly a third of all dwellings in Australia are owned by investors. So of all those investment properties, according to the ATO, 41% of them are either cash flow neutral or cash flow positive. And satisfy some curiosity, the average profit 
for those properties that are in that 41% category is $6,900 per annum, and the average loss is $6,500 a year. That's the ATO stats. Okay. So it's pretty consistent either way. So when it shifts over, you go from negative property. We can do a whole podcast on that. I think I'm going to move straight on from that. But I think we should flag a couple of these points, Simon, and get back to them when you're next in town. Point number six, $900,000. $900,000 was the median house price in Port Hedland, far northwestern Australia, when it peaked in December 2013. So Port Hedland had gone from being worth $50,000 in 1990 way up to 900 grand 23 years later and there was a point in time when Port Hedland was Australia's most expensive city in 2007. Yeah. Now, Port Hedland's got a population of about 11,000 people. That's what a mining boom can do. But interestingly, when it peaked at 900 grand, it then dropped to 210,000 mm. in by 2018. Which was well documented on smartpropertyinvestment.com.au and if you don't know about this, and I'd like to say, you know, as a student of history myself, history always repeats itself. So get informed and educated about what happened up in Port Headland and that sort of area. It's Pilbara, right? Pilbara? Yeah. yeah. Well, there's two up, stories there. Yeah. One is that it not only grew, but it grew from 50 grand to 900 grand. Well, if you were part of that growth curve and sold at 900, and a lot of la- people made, their, made a lot of dough. Well, it lasted nearly 20 years. Yeah. How good is that? But then it, like the bum fell out of it in the next two. <laughs> history does repeat itself. <laughs> And yeah. on that basis, also, rates will go up as well, right? So anyway, time for another thing. Point number seven, uh, 27,434. So that is the number of residents of Sydney that relocated in the 2018 financial year. When we hear a lot about population, we often hear the one figure. Mm. Um, so Sydney grew by, it was about 87,000 at the last, last count in a financial year. But 77,000 of that was from overseas, people relocating to Australia. And, of course, Sydney and Melbourne have the highest profile internationally. So a large proportion of them come into Sydney and Melbourne. But 27,434 people in one year left Sydney and went to different parts of Australia. So that's a net number, that total number. So people coming in and people moving out. That's a net net figure, yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. But other parts of Australia were beneficiaries of what's called internal migration. Gold Coast was the biggest beneficiary Nearly 7,500 people in one year, existing Australian residents chose to relocate to the Gold Coast. Other really big beneficiaries in no particular order here, Geelong, Sunshine Coast, Bendigo, Shoal Haven, Margaret River, Busselton, Ballarat, Scenic Rim and Wangaratta. Wanger- I see Maitland and Cessnock there as well. Yeah. The great town of Cessnock. Yep. I love it up there. Again, I know they're all regional towns. Well, and so we've got eight capital cities, mm. four capital cities, Sydney is one, lost population to internal migration. So someone who was living there said, oh, this is no longer suits my needs, I'm moving somewhere else. So four out of eight lost population and a big bunch of regional locations gained population. Okay, point number eight, $840. $840 per annum is the pre-tax cash flow profit for a typical investment property bought today. Purchase price four hundred and fifty thousand, ninety percent loan to value ratio, so only ten percent of your own money going in. Three point six percent. You talk to any broker in the country at the moment, they'll say that that is very very gettable in this market. Three point six percent interest rate on an interest only loan and a five percent yield. Right, you got ten percent, stump it up, put it in, take advantage of the low interest rates, and you are cash flow positive from day dot, even before you put your tax. If return you're in. buying those sort of properties. That's a 450 mm. purchase price. Yeah. And one point I would say to that, and it's a nice number, it sounds good, it means it's cash flow positive. I couldn't buy a property like that and be cash flow positive. If I'm investing in a trust structure, I'll be paying land tax, I'll be getting bent over on that. So I probably wouldn't be, but for the standard Australian relatively new investor, you yep. should be able to get that with irrespective of where you're investing. That's a really interesting point. But everyone's circumstance is different as well. But I think it gives you a bit of a mindset of the current environment, low interest rates, a little bit easy to get debt now. The banks are opening up. If you've been to market, I reckon this is a – a lot of people be negative about the property market, but I think it's a generational opportunity. And even, even that same property, Phil, if there was no cash deposit, so plenty mm. of investors who, you know, whether it's a family home or existing investment properties and their deposit money is coming from equity, yeah. so essentially they're financing 100% of the purchase, it's going to cost you $2,000 of your own money per year before any negative home, green benefits. Finance, yeah. That's it, two grand. It's not a lot. And you would think that the if you're investing in the right – spots, they should be going up by more than $2,000. So go back to point number one with their $35,000 age pension. Mm. There's your motivation. 
and I've just given you affordability. Get in the game, folks. There you go. Point number nine, 12. 12 is the total population increase in Bellingen, so the north coast of I know where Bellingen New is. South Wales, Bellingen near Coffs Rally. Harbour. Yeah. Yep. 12 people, that's all their population grew by last financial year. Over the last 17 years, which is as far back as ABS data goes, its total population growth was only 329 people. That's it. But yet Bellingen is ranked number 25 for our most expensive cities. Is it all cattle country it's been, up that way or sugar uh, country? Bit, a bit of tourism, a bit, bit, of, yeah. of, bit of agriculture. It's a lifestyle location, essentially. Lifestyle location. All right. Yeah. But it has been one of the best performed property markets in all of Australia over the last 20 years. It's got a higher average annual capital growth rate over the last 20 years than six out of eight capital cities. And it's a tiny little lifestyle town. I think we should flag that one, Simon, and, and go back to it at a point in time in the future podcast because I think what you're trying – to communicate there is the dispelling this myth around you need population. massive population growth in order to sustain yep. property price increases. And I think we probably need to look at the mechanics of that a little bit more, and, and I don't think we're going to have time to do it today, but I think it's a really good point. So we'll mark that down and we'll get back to it. Point number 10, 70%. 70% is the portion of Australians today who are age 65 or older that are already relying on the age pension. So I think there's a general myth, which is wrong, that a whole heap of baby boomers are, are rich and, and retired and, you know, squeezing people out of the market. Again, these are federal government stats. People in this, so there's about 3.6 million Australians today who are age 65 or older. 70% are in receipt of the age pension. 12% are still working, presumably because they haven't saved enough, enough off, money to yep. stop. And only 18% are financially independent. We can learn from those people. So financial independence, in this regards, you're talking about they don't ask the government for money to sustain Correct. themselves. Yeah. That's tiny, isn't it? Yeah. We don't teach financial literacy. Most people are good, hardworking, honest people, above average intelligence, but it's what we do with the time we've got uh, the workforce. 45 years and back to point number one, 35,000. That's, that's the number you've got to think about. Before we get to point number 11, I'm just going to go to a quick break. Back in a moment. Welcome back, everyone, to the Smart Property Investments Show. Here with Simon Presley, Head of Research, Propertyology. I'm really enjoying this discussion. Some fun facts, and uh, as I said before in my preamble of this discussion, probably some alarming facts. Uh, point number 11, Simon, 20%. 20% is the percentage of the workforce in the New South Wales city of Armadale that work in the education sector. So the Australian average, 8% of Australia's workforce work in the education sector, but Armidale is officially Australia's education capital. It's got one of the biggest universities the in University the country. University of New England? Yes, correct. Yeah, okay. And a number of really awesome private schools, some great TAFEs, so education's a big staple out there. Some fun facts on Armidale, um, it's our highest inland city. It is a city. It's well, air- as in uh, elevation, highest? Highest or- in it, yep. Okay. Yep. There's snow uh, there. As in, you know, um, distance above sea okay, level. Yeah. Beautiful part of the country if anyone mm. hasn't been there. Its airport, its economy is improving significantly. The number of passengers going through Armidale's airport increased by 14% over the last five years, which was more than the national average and more than several capital cities. And last fun fact on Armidale, the five years ending 2007, Armidale's median house price increased by exactly 100% in five years. Okay. Vacancy rate today is a very low 1.5% and yields are about 5.5. So there's obviously a story behind the surge of property in Armidale. Is what's made it do that going to continue to do it into the future? Yeah. It's not surging now. Mm. There, are some sign, there are some signs that uh, some pressure could be building. Mm. But the purpose of sharing you know, what it did in that five-year window before is, again, just to highlight every single location, no exception. Every single location in Australia has had some really prosperous periods before. Point number 12, one million. One million. Now, this is a staggering statistic. So in Australia's 230-year history, our current 25 million people, we have built 10 million dwellings to accommodate all of them. In just 16 years, the last 16 years, and in just our eight capital cities, we've built 1 million apartments in just 16 years. So we've got 10 million dwellings, 1 million of those are just the apartment stock from the last 16 years, years compared to what Australia's done over 230 years. Why do you find that an alarming figure? Don't you think the ratios got tell something there? Um, we've changed quickly. We have done. Um, yeah, but imagine 
the argument would be, well, you've got this this huge surge in migration to Australia from locations yep. who are used to living in apartment blocks yep. or, or the different way of living from Australia's. Why pick a fence, backyard, front yard, quarter acre block, right? You know, the, the argument would be they don't want this. They want apartments. Yeah. What do you say? Uh, I don't disagree with mm. that. If I was a town planner, that's very logical, logical sensible. And, yeah. and certainly to continue to, you know, um, expand their population, apartments are a big part of that program. But from an investor's perspective, mm. there are so many things that people really need to get their head around before they put some skin in the apartment game if you're an investor. And if you're buying apartments in those eight capital cities that you spoke about, it's got to be a fair price point on them, point number one. Point number two, and we're not going to go into it today, you got a question how well they've been built, which is a whole nother box of snakes that need to sort of check out. Anyway, I like the stat and I get the rhetoric around it. Simon, point number 13, 90%. 90% is the portion of the total number of investors. So Australia's got about 2.1, 2.2 million property investors that own those 3.6 million properties we were talking about earlier. But 90% of them own one or two investment properties. Certainly better than none. Mm. But in most cases, one or two investment properties will probably still leave you on that age pension in some way. So everyone's goal should be to avoid, I don't want any age pension, because if you've done that, it means you haven't acquired enough to really live the lifestyle you want. Yeah, that's, that's I see. And I look at these all the time. I think there's um, only 20,000 20,000 people have got six or more. Six or more properties, yep. which is a massive stat. Yep. If you think about that, that's more than you get to a Parramatta game in football, right, yeah, on, a, on a Sunday. Yeah. You know, like, that's so a good you, stat, if you, if you sit... <laughs> stat man. <laughs> Who do you follow? Who's your team? You probably get a lot I'm, more than 20,000 at Brisbane I am a Brisbane huge Lions. AFL yeah, yeah, fan, yeah. Brisbane Lions, yeah, unashamedly. You'd normally get 20,000 more to a game. 30-odd? 30 30-odd 30 thousand. But you think, even contextually, right, so if you sit in a stadium yep. with 20,000 people, you go, it's oh, a there's a few people here, right? It's a concert. <laughs> yeah. You go, that's the total population of Australia, 25 yep. million people who have six or more investment properties. Now, I like to think that people with six or more investment properties probably won't need the age pension. Um, they shouldn't. They shouldn't. <laughs> it depends how you if you if you invested in um, Port Hedland at the wrong time. But it depends yeah. when they buy them. If yeah, they, I know. If they this leave it till the back end of their life, you know, if they buy those those six in their mid fifties, they haven't yeah. given themselves much time from to grow. To grow. And this goes back to that thirty five thousand and the forty five years you got to actually make. Hey, interesting stat. Uh, point number fourteen. Three years. Three years. Um, excuse my laugh, but that's the total time from. Development application to construction completion of the Toowoomba International Airport, a privately owned airport that I think was about 2014, 2015 that opened. It's the only privately owned airport that's been built in the last sort of 50 odd years, but it just highlights what can be done when red tape is pushed aside. Get rid of bureaucracy, get rid of the trappings of government, get rid of political, yeah. you know, undermining. Three and- years from development application to construction completion. They're in the middle of building Badgerish Creek that was first floated 65 yeah, years ago or something. Who, who owns, who owns Toowoomba Airport? A wonderful family called the Wagners. Okay. Yeah. So that's an um, infrastructure project like that. As I said, it was built a couple of years ago, but that opens up all sorts of economic opportunities for that broad Darling Downs region. Is which it for freight and that reason? It, rather does, than- uh, it does direct passenger you know, flights daily to you know, different parts of Australia, Three but it's years. primarily for freight. Yeah. The motivation behind it is um, that's a really rich natural resources area when you get you know further west from Toowoomba. Whether where's, it's- where's Toowoomba for, for those of you? So you go, you go from Brisbane. It's yep. about an hour and a half drive up up the range. Up the range. Yep. Where, west. North, west. Straight west, isn't it? Yeah. Yep. An hour and a half. Okay. Yep. So you go further west from Toowoomba, and you've got coal, you've got gas, you've got all sort of agricultural commodities. But the challenge they've had of getting those products to market has been well. There is no challenge now. You've mm. got a massive. That's a smart airport. strategic commercial move to build an airport out there. But it goes to show three years. Stretch a bitumen and a nice terminal. You yeah. get you're getting business done. I imagine the, it'll grow over time. The value of private it. sector owning something and governments just getting out of their way and let them do what they want with their own money. Okay. Well, there's a lot of these public private relationships sort of moving forward as well, which are pretty productive. But anyway, I think we could probably do a whole thing on infrastructure development. Point number fifteen, eighteen percent, Simon. So picking up from the apartment point earlier, so eighteen percent is the total capital growth over the last ten years in South Yarra very trendy in a part of Melbourne. So Melbourne's median house price actually increased by 91% over the last 10 years. South Yarra apartments increased by 18%. 
A couple of other popular inner city Melbourne locations. Richmond's apartment value increased by 35, St Kilda by 30, that's where they're building the block at the moment, and Parkville by 12. Compare that to 91% median house price. When are we going to see you on the block bidding for clients? You won't. Never. You won't. <laughs> I could just picture you there in a fancy suit and orange tie looking good. Not I, said the fly. Paying well over uh, market rates. Uh, yeah. No, not, okay. this, not this buyer's agent. All right, agent. you've heard it there. Maybe we need to do a like a, we need to do like a block, regional block, just get some place out in Armadale and that might be more interesting. Maybe we see that. Anyway, point number 16, 10.8%. 10.8%, so the Tasmanian regional city of Burnie, 10.8% is the increase in passenger volume over the last financial year. For those who don't know Burnie, a bit more about it, a capital growth over the last 12 months, 7%. Again, well above national average over the last 12 months. Median house price in Burnie today is still a very affordable $250,000. And there's a brand new university campus. Construction will start on that at some stage Oh, we're nearly out of this year. Is that so University of Tasmania, like a, like yeah, a, yeah, a, what a university call, satellite t- hub? Yeah. They've got a big Tasmania, um, obviously, in uh, so big university in Hobart, mm. and there'll be new ones being built in Burnie and Launceston well, starting good. within the great, next Great, great university, uh, Tasmania. They do a lot of things that globally that don't happen elsewhere, so that's attracting a lot of people, I know, for a fact. Absolutely. Point number 17, 24%. So 24%, um, there's been a bit of rhetoric over the last sort of six or 12 months about, geez, Australia might have its first recession, you know, for more than a generation. So here's some stats from our last recession, which was in 1991, ended in 1992. The three-year change in median house price in Canberra was 24% on the back of the recession. Down. Up. Up. Yep. A couple of other locations that performed well in that recessionary period, Cairns 35%, Perth 33%, Griffith in New South Wales 23%, Hobart 19 Brisbane 16 East Gippsland in Victoria 15 Sydney grew by 7 Melbourne grew by 2 That was the last recession. During the period of the recession. That's from, uh, the, from... the year of the recession and yep. the two years immediately following. Per annum or, or collectively? Collectively. Over three, okay, over the three years. Collectively. Okay. Not Armageddon. It's not Armageddon, you know. In Melbourne, you're not getting CPI, but, you know, Sydney. Yeah. Well, during the last recession, Melbourne was arguably the worst economy in the entire country, not just yeah. of the capital cities. It, it really struggled back then. So all, this, changed. so all this noise around the recession then, how should you be framing it as a property investor? I mean, a recession, I guess, is referred to as a general state of the national economy. Mm. And, of course, um, you know, if the national economy is weak, it's not a good thing for property markets. But what has the biggest impact on property markets is the local economy. And that's going to be different from one capital city to the next, and every non-capital city location will have a different um, local economy as well. Okay, all right, moving right on. We've got three more points here, and I'm getting a wind-up from our producer, um, so my apologies. Uh, Point number 18, negative 315. So, yeah, Alice Springs, its population declined by 315 people over the last 17 years. Alice Springs' median house price, bearing in mind it's in the red centre of Australia, Alice Springs median house price increased by 197% over that 17-year period. Gold Coast, completely different geography, isn't it, you know, on the beach. Gold Coast median house price increased by 194%. So you might as well say they both did exactly the same over that 17-year period. One lost 300 people, one gained 227,000. Bang. Okay, this goes back to that same point, nine around Belgian, around Similar, the, yeah. the interconnectivity of uh, population growth and property prices. Again, we'll pick that up at a later date. Point number 19, Simon, 8% per annum. 8% over the last 20 years. Blacktown, which is a uh, obviously a city council of Greater Sydney. Best city in Australia, Blacktown. That's well, where I'm from. <laughs> it's, it's median house price increased by an average of 8% per annum over the last 20 years. Pretty good. Fantastic. But I'm let's literally put- about to settle on a property in Blacktown today. There you go. Yeah. Well, timing, impeccable. Yeah. Um, but, but, you know, just to compare the importance of when you pick a city, having the right pocket within the city. So over the same 20-year period, the local government authority of Inner West, so Balmain, Leichhardt, increased by 7.3%, Parramatta by 6.9%, but Blacktown was 8% over the last 20 years. That's their annual average. So the point to make is? Uh, well, the point to make there, that the so-called blue chip is very rarely the best. It just means it's more expensive. Mm. And where all the expansion's going, 
which was the, the middle ring Parramatta, if we can think where it is today and yeah, where it was, say, 10, 20, 20 years ago. Yeah. So it's evolved a lot. You know, and that has an impact, but it also, with that development, comes a lot of supply. Mm. Interesting. All right, a final point. Fun facts with Simon Presley, Head of Research Propriology. Number 20, 4.2% Simon. 4.2%. So I deliberately talk a lot about economics because it has the biggest influence on property markets. So 4.2% is the increase in job advertisements in every location in Australia outside of our eight capital cities over the last two years. The national average has actually been a reduction in job advertisements over the last two years of 0.24%. Melbourne has um, had an increase of one4 Sydney has 10% less jobs advertised today than two years ago. Canberra plus 13%, Perth plus 14%, Hobart plus 40 One of the reasons why I still think there's some petrol in the tank in Hobart. Mm. Brisbane minus 3%, Cairns plus 12%, watch Cairns. The Riverina plus 28%, so that's Wagga and Griffith, those sort of locations. Launceston, a 13% increase in job advertisements over the last two years, probably one of the strongest markets in Australia right now. And Gippsland, plus 15%. Another jobs, picture. jobs, jobs. Jobs, jobs, jobs. So there's some leading mm. indicators I've shared there. Mm. Okay. Well, it's probably the most you've ever given away, mate, over the course of a podcast with me. You're giving all the insights out what to look for. Right? Well, and I thought why we do this is because numbers is a universal language, mm. and I don't think there's anything that's more emotive than property. Emotions don't help make financial decisions. So what I tried to do today was to deliberately pick a bunch of facts on locations all around Australia in an attempt to educate and to broaden the horizons for people. Hopefully that's helped. You, you helped me out this, um, you know, to, to my earlier point around – Shifting your mindset through education is a very powerful thing. So hopefully we've just maybe challenged some preconceptions that our listeners have, what you have listening to this around this and how to look at it more without sort of a bias. Yeah. You know, I know that's what you do well as a, a property strategist is that you don't go in there trying to prove or disprove a particular bias you have. You look at the numbers and from that formulate an opinion, which is informed. So, Which is how a share investor typically makes their decisions because there isn't anything they can see and touch. Mm. Really good point. So I really do enjoy this. Fun facts. Uh, if you like what we're doing, we're happy to do a lot more of it. We'll keep shifting these up. Let's get Simon back in the studio again soon. If there's any questions you have around this, whether it's for me or for Simon, you can email the team here and I'll make sure I'll get them to Simon. Uh, it's uh, editor at smartpropertyinvestment.com.au. And we're going to do a Q&A session soon. So send your questions in. We'll chat about it. Absolutely anything. Simon, you're happy to come back and do a Q&A piece. Um, we'll bang into it and get it done. Uh, Simon, thanks for coming down. I know it's a, it's a trip for you to come down to Sydney from – from sunny Brisbane to record these. So it is appreciated and uh, and I know our listeners do appreciate it as well. So thank you very much. I enjoy it. Thanks very much. Remember to check out smartpropertyinvestment.com.au. If you'd like to get your info through social media, Smart Property HQ, go and check it out and that's how you can keep connected with what's going on in property markets right across Australia and regional Australia as well. Remember, um, if you like what we're doing with this stuff and you're finding it of value, please keep those reviews coming. We do appreciate it. Just click that review button on the podcast player wherever you're listening to it. It's pretty straightforward to do it. The guys and girls get a real kick out of the feedback that we get. We'll be back again next time. Until then, bye-bye. The information featured in this podcast is general in nature and does not take into consideration your financial situation or individual needs and should not be relied upon. Before making any investment, insurance, tax, property or financial planning decision, you should consult a licensed professional who can advise whether your decision is appropriate for you. Guests appearing on this podcast may have a commercial relationship with the companies mentioned.